take home message, the longer the bond, the weaker it is. Hi, this is Dr. Cook, your Chem 240 instructor. Let's take a look at the next video. In today's video, we're going to talk about haloalkanes, organic molecules that contain the halogens fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. These types of compounds that contain halogen atoms in them are ubiquitous in our society and in the environment. Some of them are man-made and some of them are natural products. For example, many common solvents contain halogens such as chlorine. These are used for dry cleaning or for organic chemistry or for industrial processes. Others, like the chlorofluorocarbons, contain two different kinds of halogens. These have been used for a long time as refrigerants and that has largely been banned due to the problems with these when they reach the upper atmosphere. They do break down under ultraviolet light from the sun and uh, damage the ozone. Other compounds such as the compound on the right shown on this slide, epibatidine, is a natural compound isolated from an Ecuadorian uh, tree frog. This compound, as you can see, contains a chlorine atom, um, which does occur naturally, and I think a lot of people think that halogenated compounds are only unnatural and dangerous, when in fact they could be used for medicines um, and are found in a lot of natural sources, particularly marine sources, because the oceans contain quite a bit of halogens, chloride, for example. Well, in naming alkanes that contain halogen compounds, we need to keep in mind that there's some common naming system that's very prevalent in organic naming systems. For example, in these cases I've shown here, methyl bromide is not the official IUPAC name because it considers bromide as sort of the parent molecule and methyl as a substituent, hence the YL ending, or cyclopentyl iodide, or secondary butyl chloride, for example. These are all uh, ways to describe halogen compounds using more inorganic type nomenclature systems that utilize the halogen as a salt in some ways. If we were to name these according to the IUPAC naming rules, methyl bromide would be called bromomethane, cyclopentyl iodide would be called iodocyclopentane, and secondary butyl chloride would be called 2-chlorobutane. Notice we take the halogen substituent, drop the I-N-E ending from the halogen, and add an O. So chlorine becomes chloro, fluorine becomes fluoro, bromine becomes bromo and iodine becomes iodo. In terms of numbering the compound chains, halogens get the same preference as other alkyl substituents, so it's all dependent on which is closest to the end. In these two examples, we have 4-bromo, 2-methyl hexane, because the methyl substituent on the hexane is closer to one end of the chain. Whereas if you switch those positions, now it's the bromine which is on the 2-carbon and the methyl is on the 4. So there's no preference for always starting with a halogen over an alkane. They get equal priorities in terms of trying to figure out which direction you number from. So whichever one of those is closest, you would choose that to number with. Well, when we start to talk about reactions of alkyl halides, we often refer to the degree of alkyl substitution that the halogen is attached to because that does have some impacts on differences in reactivity. So we can get used to utilizing these designations to talk about different kinds of halogen compounds. For example, if a bromine is on the end of a chain, uh, such as in one bromopropane, we refer to this as a primary bromide because the bromine atom is attached to a carbon which has one degree of alkyl substitution. A tertiary chloride is a chlorine that's attached to a carbon that has a tertiary degree of alkyl substitution. It's attached to three other carbons. Um, or a secondary halogen compound, such as a secondary iodide in this cyclopentane molecule. It is important to recognize the properties of alkyl halides because they do dictate their reactivity. And if we have an understanding of the differences in polarities, the differences in the bond strengths, we can get an idea about what types of reactions can proceed. In a halogen compound, the halogen is generally more electronegative than the carbon it's attached to. That electronegativity does change depending on the halogen. As you go up on the periodic table, it's 
more electronegative, and as you go down on the periodic table, those halogens become less electronegative. And so you can notice that in the bond polarity, which we measure as a dipole moment in a unit called Debye's, that dipole moment is greatest for the chlorine and fluorine compounds and drops as you go to the iodo compound. But it's not just the difference in electronegativities that affect the polarities of bonds. It is also the bond length, and as the atoms of the halogen gets larger, that, of course, increases the length of the bond. And the longer the bond is, the weaker that bond tends to be. And so the bond strength is somewhat correlated with the size of the atoms affecting the bond length. Take home message, the longer the bond, the weaker it is. And the weaker the bond is, the more reactive it's going to be. So in fact, when we were talking about doing reactions where we are reacting to break a carbon halogen bond, the weaker the bond is, the more reactive it will be. And so iodo compounds are going to be more reactive than bromine compounds and chlorine compounds. And it is those three halogens which are the most commonly used for reactions because those bonds are weak enough to break under various types of reactions. Fluorine compounds are a little bit different. Um, they are actually very, very stable compounds, and you can see the bond strength is quite high. As a matter of fact, fluorine compounds such as polymers of alkanes that contain fluorines like Teflon can withstand very high temperatures without breaking down because those bonds are somewhat inert. We actually think about fluoro compounds as in a slightly different category than alkyl halides when we talk about reactivity. So in this chapter we're going to talk a lot about the reactions of chloro, bromo, and iodo compounds and not necessarily applicable to fluorine containing compounds. In the bond polarity, you notice that all of these have the carbon end as being partially positive and the halogen end being partially negative. You can see this in the electrostatic map here where the large amount of red character in the electrostatic map is surrounding the halogen and there's blue around the carbon it's attached to. That's an important distinction to remember when we talk about reactivity that it's a carbon that's electrophilic. Carbon is an electrophile when we talk about different reactions. In the previous chapters, we talked about a couple of ways in which we can prepare alkyl halide compounds from alkenes. For example, the simple addition of a hydrogen halide to an alkene generates a new carbon-halogen bond. In this case, adding HBr to the alkene gives a bromo compound. Or we can add diatomic halogens such as Br2 or Cl2 or I2 to make new carbon-halogen bonds. In this way, we can prepare various alkyl halides to utilize in other types of reactions. When we talk about the reactions of alkyl halides, these are generally dominated by two main processes. One of those is a substitution reaction, which we've seen briefly in the previous chapters, and the other is an elimination reaction. In a substitution reaction, when you have a carbon-halogen bond that's polarized, you can use a nucleophile to displace or exchange the halogen for the nucleophile. In this case, I've shown a simple example of an OH- nucleophile, a hydroxide nucleophile, which forms a new bond to the carbon and the bromine is kicked off with its electron pair. So what we end up with is a bromide ion and a new carbon-oxygen bond. So we have substituted the bromine for the OH. In previous chapters, we saw the same process using the carbon ions generated from alkynes. So if you recall, if we can generate these anions by deprotonating an alkyne, those can form new carbon-carbon bonds in the exact same process where the negative charge exchanges the carbon from the acetylide with the bromine. And the other typical reaction of alkyl halides is the elimination reaction. And this occurs when you take a hydrogen from one end, a adjacent carbon, and a bromine from another carbon off to generate a new double bond. This is just the direct opposite reaction from addition. So if you add HBr to a double bond, you add hydrogen to one end, and a bromine to the other end. So you end up with hydrogen and bromine. This is just the opposite of an addition reaction. And so to carry out these types of reactions, generally we need some kind of a base in order to deprotonate or take a hydrogen off. So the in this case, OH- takes the proton on an adjacent carbon. The electrons from the carbon-hydrogen bond move down to form a new pi bond. <clears throat> At the same time, the carbon-bromine bond breaks and this forms now an alkene and we have eliminated essentially the elements of H plus and Br minus from the alkyl halide. In the next video we're going to talk a lot about the various 
mechanisms by which these processes can take place.